After I wrapped up the last video, it didn't take longer than 10 hours, yes, 10 hours, for the method I was describing to become quasi obsolete, as developer Exponential ML created a brand new set of model scope nodes which have an SD 1.5 input, which means that, yes, you can now bring your control nets, IP adapters, anything you want. In plain English, this means the quality of the first stage is considerably superior to what I showed you last time, and we have a breakthrough on our hand when it comes to video generation with open source tools. As you saw in the intro, this bleeding edge technique allows for the generation of rather convincing human beings. But wait, it gets even better. What we built in the last video wasn't a waste, because during these recordings, I came up with the idea of replacing the second stage, which if you remember was the model scope V2 V upscale, with Supir, and immediately had results that blew me away. Honestly, this is unlike anything I've ever seen before. In fact, using this technique, we're now able to get 4K worth of details out of Comfy, interpolated to 60 FPS, straight from a workflow. I developed the green hue, the film grain, the creepy look, and the oversaturation entirely through leveraging the right models and finding the correct animate diff evolve settings. I bet you want to get started. So let me show you how to install and create a workflow for the new nodes. And afterwards, I'll take you through my progress on a universal video generator I've been working on and I think you're going to enjoy this a lot. Let's go. All right, so first, there is no documentation. <laughs> it's brand new, so of course there is no documentation. What I did is what I always do, learn by trial and error over long nights of no sleep. First, you're going to need the nodes. You're going to open your file explorer, you're going to find your custom node directory, you're going to click the URL bar, you're going to type CMD, and then it's going to open a terminal window where you can git clone the link you copied from the repo. It's very straightforward, it's how it always works. Next, you need to download the model, or I should say the models, because remember you have T2V, V2V, and just to make things simpler, there's more than one version. Now, personally, I really enjoy the ones from Serpents because I know they work, I used it in the last video, and you can select, in fact, I encourage you to get both the 576 and the Excel model, which is the 1024 V2V model stuff. Once you've downloaded all that, you need to find the right place for them. In your config UI directory, you're going to find something called models. In there, there is a clip folder. You're gonna take for each model the clip and you're gonna paste it. Now, little trick here, it doesn't matter what it's called. This is true for most things in Confi. You could call it whatever you want. Just do something that you remember and you can even put it into a subdirectory. As you can see here, I've already downloaded most of them. In fact, I've downloaded all of them. And then next you need to find a text to video folder if it doesn't exist, create it, that's perfectly fine. And copy paste what you downloaded, the text to video PyTorch model, rename it to something you remember once again, maybe put it into a subdirectory, whatever, and you're good to go. Or are you? Actually, there is one last thing. You need a LoRa. That LoRa is super hard to find. You have to prep it yourself, which I think most of you won't want to do. So what I did is I made it available to you on a mega.co download link. It's available in the description. It will stay there for as long as Mega allows me to host it and you're ready to go. So we're going to restart or start Confi UI, and now we can start noodling. We'll start from a completely blank page because this is so straightforward. I want to show it to you step by step. First, we grab model scope T2V loader, which is the node we've just installed, evidently. We make sure that we have used the right model in there. It's whatever name you've given it. In my case, it's called that. Yours could be different. It doesn't matter as long as it's the same file. Next, we need to load the clip. So that's going to be, again, the clip that we've downloaded prior. And for those that are not familiar, in Stable Diffusion, the clip is used to match images to text description, of course. Next, we're going to need our LoRa. That's the one we've downloaded from the mega site. I'm sure in the future this will change, by the way. It'll be more generally available, but for now, use the one I've provided you. Uh, where is it? There. Make sure that it's set to one and one. We want it at maximum strength. Next up, evidently, we need a clip text encode prompt. I'm going to connect it roughly. We'll finish it up a little bit later. For now, it's good enough. And next up, we're going to need to go and grab our latent. Because unlike last time, 
we don't have access to a latent. We're going to have a key sampler, all that stuff. So we have to make sure that it matches the dimension, 576 and 320 respectively. And be careful with the height because sometimes for some weird reason in the current version of Confi, the height changes. And I've had it auto set to 340, it was really annoying. So make sure that it's 576 by 320. It's what the model was trained on and it's what will work best. The batch size, of course, is the number of frames you want for your video. And just like last time, you want to stick to about 20 frames max. You can't go below 16 and anything above 42 is probably gonna lose temporal consistency to the point where it's unusable or become noise. Of course, your mileage may vary, but for now, let's stick to 24. We'll see how we can extend this using animate diff in the next stage. Right, so next I'm going to go and grab a load V. Now, here I just use the standard SDXL V. It's the default one for SDXL base model. It's nothing special about it. It's just that I needed one, so I'll use this one. And then when we connect an SD 1.5 model, we'll use the V from that instead. We're gonna need a case sampler. The seed needs to be set to lucky, 777. Now, that's a joke, of course, you can put whatever you want. I'll just choose fix right now so it caches. Steps works very similarly to last time, but the values are slightly different, I suppose. 30 steps I found work quite well when you're not using an SD 1.5 model. And in terms of CFG, just be mindful that CFG 1 is not implemented at the current time, so anything above 1 is fine. But yet again, because in the future we're going to use an SD 1.5 model, for now it's good enough to leave it around 15. We're going to leave the samplers to Euler and Keras. I've done some tests. Uh, if you want to see the output of this really briefly, I'll put them on screen right now so you can see the difference between the different samplers and how they behave. But again, no surprise, it's exactly like last time. So go with whatever works best for the type of image you're trying to create. Evidently, we need a VD code. Oh yeah, important. So for the prompt, I've done a lot of tests and I've used very long, complicated, plain English stuff. I've used comma separate keywords, I've used just a few words. What I found was when you put only a few words, it's only drawing exactly that. And it doesn't try too much to reinvent the rest depending on which parameters you have it set at, which can create some pretty cool artistic stuff. So I recommend for the time being for you to use as few words as possible. That's probably the best thing you can do when it comes to getting started and then add to it over time until you're satisfied with the output. And as for the negative prompt, very interesting factoid here, you want to leave it blank because the video set on which this was trained did not contain any watermark or anything like that. They've been very good with copyright actually. So the way it works is that you leave it blank and then when you see things in the image you don't want to see, then you add them to the negative prompt. It's really, really straightforward. Let's go and add a video combine at the back of it. Now that's the standard VHS video combine. We're going to change the settings. Actually, let's have a quick look through them. For frame rate, I'm gonna set it to 24. I just like doing that. If you wanna put something else to try to then interpolate it to create some cool stuff, do that. For the file name, I'll put model scope 576 tutorial. For the format, I'm gonna stick to MP4 H.264 because it's the one that gives us access to the CRF and I just find it easier that way. Put the CRF at four so it's near lossless, let's say. And now I just need to make sure that I wire up all my noodles properly. And once that's done, we can finally hit Q. There you go. So this is pretty fast, by the way. I found it really, really fast. Of course, when we use animate diff, it's gonna be even faster because we're gonna use animate diff LCM. And while I have you because this is rendering, I just wanna point out something that's true about all my tutorial. Things that I cover change very, very quickly. It's open source, that's the whole point. It also means the installation and the usage might change over time. So please refer to the GitHub repo and you'll find the support section for each node on that GitHub repo if you're having technical issues. Okay, the output is out, but I don't really like it. I think it looks too plain. And, and just like everything in Stable Diffusion, this is a numbers game. So we're gonna generate something else and see what the outputs look like. Now the models have been preloaded in RAM, so yeah, it's much faster. Hey, I could work with that. I'm gonna switch the seed to randomize and I'm gonna run a bunch in series. That's usually how I do things. That's how you should organize yourself. You create all the parameters to the settings that you think will look good and you press Q. 
I'll teach you later how to use this to your advantage when the workflow gets gigantic, because it will get gigantic. And now we're getting pretty consistent output, which I think looks pretty damn good for three minute work. So imagine the kind of stuff we're going to get on the full workflow. Okay, on this one, evidently it's tried to draw some sort of hotel, I guess, and it looks pretty bad. So how did we solve it last time? Well, we had an upscaler step that was an all-in-one animate diff LCM, which passed the pixels to ultimate SD upscale with a high enough diffusion step can redraw things. And given the size of the tile being large enough, we'll draw something that's more meaningful. So think of it as a smoothing step, I guess you could call it that, or a reconstruction step. Whereas straight up scalers would just simply upscale the ugliness of the output. And this is something we need to be very mindful of in this process. And this is why I've organized my workflow in multiple steps. Oh, and because I like to go into depth with my tutorials, I just wanted to point out that temporal attention strength simply means the differential between each image. So if you set this to zero, you're gonna get what is a 24 frame per second slideshow, which is trippy, but not exactly great. And the temporal convolution strength setting essentially creates an initial image that's consistent with all the subsequent images, but the sequence will lose its temporal properties, meaning it will move strange. I want to keep this video fun and engaging for you guys, but at the same time, I don't want to be the jerk that teaches you how to draw an owl this way. So I'm going to show you not only how you add a model to this thing, but in addition, how do you use animate diff with it? And we're going to draw the noodles together. And in addition, after that, I'm going to have a little education segment on how to use this workflow, what makes it tick and how to get the results that you want. So stay tuned. Oh, and by the way, to noodle is now officially a verb. We're going to start with the exact same workflow we just created. It's exactly the same one, nothing's changed. But I want to show you the sort of thing that Xeroscope tends to struggle with. And that's evidently humans. So I'm gonna type a beautiful woman smiling, something that Modelscope historically had a lot of trouble with. And yeah, you can tell that the results aren't exactly as expected. So what do we do? Well, we add evidently a checkpoint and that checkpoint can be anything you want as long as it's 1.5. You can have anything you want, but it has to be 1.5. So we're going to pick Epic Photogasm because I had good results with it. And I'm going for this really dark, really creepy look. Now don't ask me why, it's just something I like, okay? So we're going to connect our checkpoint to Modelscope T2V loader. And I'm going to change these two values. We just covered them, but when used in conjunction with AD, they tend to behave a little bit differently. So stick to something like 0.5. And then of course, we're going to add our LoRa loader model only. And we're going to pick animate LCM for SD 1.5 T2V LoRa sensors. Now, this is not a tutorial on animate diff, but if you're familiar with animate diff, you'll recognize immediately what I'm trying to do. It's a very standard workflow. I will drag my model to the load LoRa. So we create a nice little pipeline and I'll clean this up quickly. And of course the challenge that I'm presented with here is I, I don't have any made diff yet. So I need to include it. In order to do that, I use the gen two nodes. If you want to use the gen one nodes, they do exactly the same thing under the hood as the gen two nodes, but I prefer the gen two nodes. So I'll use this. I'm gonna go for LCM to square root linear. You can use something else. The reason I'm using this schedule is because I want that creepy look and I know that this works well. It took me forever to figure this out. I'm very proud of it. So I'll connect the model properly and then I'll create a little group for animate diff to go into because ultimately animate diff is kind of like the self-contained thing. All the nodes are going to go into use evolve sampling. So I might as well. I'm going to go and add an apply animate diff model advanced. Why advanced? Well, because that's the one I enjoy using and it has more features that we might want to use in the future. Next, I'm going to load the animate diff model itself. And that's going to be animate LCM SD 1.5 T2V, of course, but there are many other options, including Hotshot Excel, etc. But since we're using SD 1.5, we're going to use this one. Then there's scale multival. If you're wondering what that does, more or less, if you set this value low, it's barely gonna move. If you set this value high, it's gonna be all over the place. It's extraordinarily sensitive, so don't deviate too much. I'm gonna set it to 0 0.950. That's a good decent setting that should manage to get the jittering a little bit lower. Next, I need to add my context options. Here you have a lot of choices. Specifically, if you have a lot of VRAM, personally, I would go for views only, but 
if you don't, Standard Uniform will do nicely. It's a good starter place, I think, for Animate Diff. And if you don't know what these things do, if you don't understand what a context length is, there's a great tutorial on the Animate Diff Evolve GitHub. The link is in the description. I highly recommend you go check it out because it's a treasure trove of information and I've learned so much by going through it. Right, we're almost finished. One thing I enjoy doing is adding free init iteration. If you're not familiar with what that does, it kind of smooths out the movement, but unfortunately, if you use FreeNet itself, it tends to cook the image, specifically within this use case, specifically this use case. But in other use cases, it's just fine. So I'll use DinkInit instead, because I know that it doesn't burn the image. Now, you might want to burn the image on purpose, by the way. Okay, so now it's pretty much all set. I just need to switch this to free noise because as the name indicates, it's free. And I'll slap in a free UV tube. Finally, I'll clean up the noodles and then I'll drag my V all the way to the decode, of course. Uh, there we go. Oh, it's difficult. Yeah, got it. And we no longer need the load V. Now we need to address the case sampler. In the case sampler, obviously I need to change the number of steps. This is LCM, so it's gonna be six. It can't be anything else. The CFG, I like to keep it low. You can set it to whatever you want, but I'm going for that look, remember? For the scheduler, we'll use SGM uniform. For the sampler, we'll of course use LCM. So I'll use that. I'll clean up some more node. I'll connect my clip to my LoRa. Another thing that's worth noticing here, I suppose, is that you have this switch enable attention. The good news is, is that it's entirely automated. If you pass it a model, even if it says on, it's going to be automatically disabled and it will enable the temporal attention of model scope itself. So you don't have to worry too much about it. Personally, I like to leave it on because it's simpler that way, but you could turn it off. It would make no difference whatsoever since you have a model plugged in. Finally, just before we press Q, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit more. And of course, because we're using an SD 1.5 model, I have to put my negative prompt of text, comma, watermark, hit Q and I'm gonna fast forward this for you guys. Ooh, yeah. I did get my creepy effect, but it's a little bit too creepy. And I think what it is is simply my free UV2 model is set to zero on B1. And obviously that's not gonna be good. So I'm gonna fix this. I'm gonna disable also free init iteration options because I don't need to smooth out the movement on the human face. It makes no sense whatsoever. I'm gonna press Q again. And here we are. So now we have exactly what I was after, which is this sort of very creepy 70s look with that green hue, that sort of pseudo film grain, if you want to call it that. And of course that great vignetting. I love that setting. But you may be asking yourself, hey, Stefan, what if I wanted to use this and not do creepy things like you do? Well, there is a solution, of course. I've loaded here a completely box standard animate diff workflow. It's just a demo. It's not meant to be the best animate diff workflow on earth but it works. It uses a simple sampler custom node, which has been wired to the little trick of using a sampler LCM cycle node. And what that does is it does two Euler step, two LCM steps, two Euler steps, two LCM steps. And I find personally for Animu and Mango, it turns out to be much better in terms of output. And if you look at this, I think it's not too bad. Of course, the face is not where it should be at, but I didn't want to include a face detailer as part of this. It made no sense for a tutorial. The goal was to see what it does to an animation. And if we can or not get more than 24 frames for or model scope. Talking about model scope, let's go and drag it in and connect it before LoRa. And for good luck, we'll put that LoRa that you downloaded. But that being said, when using model scope in this context, I don't think it makes that much of a difference or should. But in any case, I'll include it for the sake of completeness. And now we can look, thanks to the magic of the internet, at the output already. And I think that we went from something that looked really cartoonish to something that has more photorealistic elements. And I'm very happy with those results. I think it looks really nice. And of course, most importantly, we've managed to pull a 120 frame from model scope. We finally did it. So it's possible, guys. Quick reminder, you're two thirds into the video and you clearly are benefiting from it. So why don't you hit that like button? You can think of it as voting for your favorite candidate at the next presidential election. I mean, you don't want that other guy to win, right? Do you? I, you know what to do.
So in order for you to understand how to use the workflow that I've made available, let me give you a quick overview of how it works on a diagram. And as you can see, I spared absolutely no expense on animation technology. First, we have T2V0 scope. That's our text to video engine. That's the thing we just built. And this is also the same thing we built in the last video, just using a different set of node. As you probably understand by now, it's going into a V2V, so a video to video model that's going to upscale it to 1024.576, or so you think. In fact, what's really happening is we have an upscaler by model. It can be any of the models that you downloaded from OpenModelDB, which then is downscaled to end up in V2V0 scope, which technically speaking doesn't upscale anything but adds more detail. What kind of detail? Well, for example, it could be adding snow, it could add freckles to the face, it could do this kind of thing, depending on the type of video you feed it. So this was the previous technique, and that's when it occurred to me I could use Supir. Supir, of course, has a much better output. So starting now, I'm gonna use these little icons of images so that you can easily understand the quality of them as they come out of each node. From T2V0 scope, the quality is really bad. From V2V0 scope, we get something far more usable, but it's still a little bit pixelated. So that's why in the last video, we introduced the ADLCM upscaler. What that does is it uses animate diff and ultimate SD upscale to output a much better image. If I was to draw the process here, we're going from T2V0 scope through an upscaler to a downscaler via V2V0 scope to an ADLCM upscaler, which outputs the type of image you saw in the previous video. And I think most people would agree that's pretty damn good. By now, depending on the factor of the ADLCM upscaler, you can get it to 4K already. But that's when it hit me. Why was I using an upscale, a downscale, and a model to add detail, which technically speaking, is a diffusion process when I could have replaced this entire section with something like Supir. So if I remove those and I add my Supir upscaler at 2x, Supir does a much better job than V2V0 scope at adding detail, at correcting blemishes, at adding pore on the skin. It just looks better. It looks super sharp, in fact. I was really pleased with this output, but I thought, hey, I can probably do better. This is when I spent about 17 hours developing an SDXL Lightning Upscaler, which also uses Animate Diff, but leverages SDXL and multiple control nets to potentially get an even better image depending on your needs. And this is really the operating keyword here, depending on your needs. If you turn the denoising all the way up, you're going to show more of the underlying model that you've been leveraging. This is also true, by the way, for the regular Animate Diff LCM technique. It depends on a model. And this is why in all my videos, I encourage you to leverage a simple workflow to test the output of your model of choice. Maybe you're going for something that looks like an anime. Go for that then. If maybe you're going for photorealistic, that's fine too. Use what works, switch the model, switch the parameters, play with the denoise, add free UV2, add Koya Deep Shrink. I've placed all this into the workflow for you and this is a great time to remind you that workflows aren't apps. They aren't meant to be something where you load an image and click a button and suddenly the perfect output comes up. No, you're going to need to change all the parameters around this workflow, including the animate diff ones, in order to get the best outcome possible. For example, I wanted to go for a 70s look. It took me a good few hours to get it right, to get that vignette effect, that overly green hue to the picture. I think it looks really cool. But if you're going for something that looks like it was filmed yesterday, or maybe you want something that looks like an anime, then you're going to need to change a lot of settings in order for it to work exactly as you want. Let's give the proper workflow a try. It's a complex workflow, so I've organized everything into groups. We're going to enable zero scope with 81 step, as well as its model pipeline, which I separated so you have more control over the output. Then I'm going to select a model. I'm a big fan of Epic Photogasm. I'm going to make sure that all the settings are aligned with my expectations, including free UV2, etc. I've disabled free init iteration options for the reasons I've explained earlier. And I like to use pyramid for the fuse method. Couple of things of note, you have access to a file name prefix node that helps you organize your files. And trust me, you're going to need it. And second, I also use play sound by Python Goss, which gives you the ability to play your own mp3 file when the workflow completes. It's kind of fun. If you get an mp3 file not found error, you know why. It's because you need to type notify.mp3. Don't forget to change the prompt every single time because the prompt is passed across the workflow for each step. It's really important. And make sure to use a new fixed random seed because it's easier to get back to the output every single time. I'm going to hit Q, follow execution. I'm going to fast forward this. And here's the output. 
I think this isn't bad, but usually I would run 10, 20 different iteration until I'm happy with the output. I'm a little bit concerned about the eyes, they look too shimmery. And when you upscale this with Supir, it tends to look a little bit janky, if you will, as well as sometimes in the third stage upscaler. But nonetheless, let's give it a shot because this is a tutorial. So I'm gonna click enable S2 model upscale. And because everything is organized into group, it's automatically going to trigger the zero scope stage two group. Now I'm going to go and select the video that we just created and as you can see I've created a lot of these things over the last few days actually way too many let's go and pick up our file we're ready to go oh yes this is important here you can select the variable that represents the frame from any other stage which means if you have enough VRAM you could theoretically pass something that's already been upscaled back to superior and so on and so forth so each box in the workflow is independent of each other and allows you to upscale, downscale in any order you want. Of course, you still need to have some sort of generation step, but this also hints at the fact that you can restore old videos. And we'll look at that in a second. For the superior options, I like to use the Q model for this type of video. And here's our composited prompt error negative prompt, which needs to be accurate because Supir is going to use it to regenerate each frame based on the prompt. It's a diffusion based upscaler after all. In terms of settings, steps, I've explained this in the previous video, 45 is a good number if you have a scale of two. And I'm going to leave everything else by default because I've already adjusted them to work with most videos. It's worth noting that with the Supir upscaler, as well as any of the other upscaler in this workflow, there's a downscale process and both will be saved to a file and a variable so you can still use this workflow even if you don't have that much VRAM. That being said, 16 gig is strongly recommended. And now we wait. Supir can be very slow, even on smaller frames. This one is 1024 by 576, but the output is well worth the wait, trust me. And we're back. It took about 10 minutes. It's the average time I found Supir would take for a 1024 by 576 video with 24 frames being loaded at a time. And the output is exactly as I expected. It's really good, of course, but the eyes are quite shimmering. And this is concerning because when we get to the third stage, they're probably going to look a little bit weird. You always have to start with really good output. Oh yes, I absolutely want to show you my SDXL upscaler. I worked hard on it, so I might as well. Let's go and enable this in the options. So I'm going to select SDXL Lightning and its associated model pipeline. I'm also going to have access to three different control nets. I did not name them because evidently control nets are just whatever they may be. You can choose a depth control net, you can have a color control net, use whatever works for the image that you're working with. Here again, we're presented with the same two options of being able to select a file or a variable. In my case, I want to select a file. I'm breaking down my process into different stages and I'm going to select the video that we just created. Why not? I'm going to make sure that I load all 24 frames and I've created everything for you, including a resolution detector. I've implemented the control nets. They all work with SDXL, of course, because this is SDXL lightning. You can select any LoRa you want. And of course, the higher the diffusion, the more these settings will be important. Talking about settings, it looks like I forgot to disable SAG, free UV2 and auto CFG. We don't need them in this case. That's fixed. I'm going to have a quick look at the various options. When it comes to the model name for HSXL, there's an FP32 version available if you have a very, very fast machine or cluster. But because I'm on my local machine, I'll stick to FP16. And of course, you can select the upscale model. Now I'm using a face, so it would be wise to use a face specific model. I'll go for, let's say, one of the Nomos version. Again here, you have to be very, very careful with the options that you choose for the upscaler. We're on lightning, so it's eight steps. What I do is I tend to write it into the name of the model. It's a little bit cheeky, but it, it's useful to remember what's what. So it's gonna be eight step. The CFG has to be one. It's demanded by this particular checkpoint that uses lightning. And a simpler name, there's a little bit more freedom here, but be careful. Some checkpoints on Civit AI require a specific sampler and scheduler. Once again, we find our file extensions, which allows you to organize things into folders. And we have two of them because one of them is connected to the interpolator. I'm going to press Q and we can already see the result of the control nets. Little trick here if you're not familiar, but Confi UI reads from right to left, not from left to right, like you would expect, and from bottom 
to the top of the screen, so everything that's on the bottom right gets executed first. Let's look at the output. Well, I think it's pretty good. It looks sharp, but unfortunately the skin has been smoothed out a bit. In an ideal world, we would have Superior plus Ultimate SD Upscaler, but I guess the machines for that haven't been invented yet. And as I predicted, the eyes are shimmering, and of course this could be corrected with a face detailer, and this is something I'm planning to add to this workflow. I want it to be a generic workflow that allows you to generate SVD, animate diff, zero scope, and even have things like puppeteering through open pose, but that's for another episode. So a big question I had is can we use this on an old video? This is a great time to try the Ultimate SD Upscaler using Animate Diff LCM. I'm going to enable it. I'm going to once again make sure that I connect my load video to the right noodle. And I'm going to select a very, very, very old video. It was taken with a digital camera that's 20 years old. Essentially, the video in question is a post stamp size. It's 176 by 144 pixels. It's absolutely tiny. There's nothing to recover in that image, but I'm a hopeful kind of guy and I like to try crazy things. So once again, I'm going to check that my pipeline is in order. And of course here you could load any LoRa you want. And once again, I forgot to disable SAG, Deep Shrink, etc. So we'll do this. But remember, if your diffusion is high, you probably want them on, except SAG because currently that's not working with Animate Diff LCM. Oh yes, I left all the noodles when it comes to composited prompts out, so if you wanted to override them, you could. Talking about prompt, remember what I said earlier, it's important to change it every time because of the diffusion step? Let's not forget to change our prompt from a beautiful woman smiling to an Asian woman dancing in a bedroom because I know that's the content of the video. Now, another good tip, in order to test your diffusion steps and in order to make sure that you have everything set up correctly, leave the scaling at just one. This way, it won't take that much time and you'll see the output to see maybe if the skin got messed up, that kind of thing. Let's have a go at it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, okay. Well, I didn't expect that good of a result, actually. Uh, this is, well, this is interesting. Uh, tell you what, let's go and open the original file and we're going to compare them side by side. Wow, yeah, and that's with only 0.2 denoise. I feel like this is something that beats Topaz. I wasn't expecting such a good result. So even though it wasn't part of this video, I started increasing the denoise levels and the results were really good. I did have to mess up a little bit with the control net and I think it would be nice to add a couple more. And of course, we're not going to be able to recover the face just like we couldn't in my video about photo upscalers because we probably don't have enough pixels to recover it. And in addition, what's imagined is not my wife yet again. Yes, I've made that joke twice now. If you're wondering what that looks like on something that's already decent to start with, that's what it looks like. And I think we can all agree that the output is simply fantastic. There is no post-production here. I did not recolor it. I did not put it through Resolve, nothing. This is literally just out of comfy. So imagine what we could do if we added more tools to this process. This won't be my last video on the topic because I really enjoy building this workflow for you guys. I want to add all the things I talked to you about and more, and there will be further videos. I can't wait to show you, but if you've built something on top of that that expands its capacities, or if you've learned something, please, please, please contact me on Discord. And for those that are interested in my videos, there's more on the screen right now that you can go and check out. I hope this was useful and entertaining. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.